Monday, the 17th of April, 2023. We all belong to South Africa and South Africa belongs to all of us. Oh, our Tambo said that. Today, the future of the ANC in the Western Cape, we've got Cameron Dugmore, leader of the opposition in the Western Cape legislature in studio. Meanwhile, over 100 killed in Sudan as rival military groups fight for control of the country. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. We got him. Tabo Besta, an accomplice nab just 10 kilometers from Kenya. Once they got there, they would have been gone with the wind. Finally, and sadly, activist Luisa Nkola was shot and killed in Philippi in a community meeting. One other person was wounded. The track you listen to is the Come Up by Audio Binger. I'm Roscoe Palm, and I'm with Nantel Hopley. Nantel, yes, sir. how was it long weekend, bro? Amazing. Every day should be a holiday. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I had some parties that didn't stop. Let's put it that way. It's hard to get, in, get back in the flow, but here we yeah. are. Looking forward to Workers' Day, May yes, Day. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, so I want to talk to Cameron Dugmore, particularly about this uh, Luisa and Caller thing. That was really terrible news that we all heard today. Yeah, it was a huge uh, shock. I, at a personal level, I haven't been in touch with Luisa for a number of years. I think all of us know the role he played in the youth league in mobilizing communities, the Sescona period in, in, in the province. And uh, it came as a complete shock, firstly, just hearing that, you know, firstly, the rumors came through on social media, ANC network saying people had been shot. And then shortly afterwards, people said Luiso, and everyone was saying Nkotla. Yeah. And then it was confirmed and, and a former counselor, as you mentioned, also injured. And it's always um, very difficult to speculate um, because of the fact that one of the first reactions to say is, is this part of the extortion youth gangs in the in in the city, which is a seriously endemic problem that we're facing across many, many communities in, in the Cape Town area. Um, and, you know, throughout the day, there's been speculation, but I think it's more been a question of shock that a vibrant young person who's actually been very rooted uh, in Cape Town communities um, is no more. Um, we don't know the full details. I know that his body was only removed from the site late this afternoon. Uh, the police have been conducting an investigation, closed off the area. Um, I also um, sent a message to um, his wife offering condolences. But I think it really has shocked the broad activist community, communities around Philippi, Kai Litcher, and a lot of youth activists who worked with him in the ANC Youth League, um, many activists who worked with him in Sescona. And I just think that we must apply a huge amount of pressure on the police to make a speedy arrest. It appears that there were others around, and hopefully there um, are witnesses who will come forward. But I think it underlines um, the reality that in many of our communities, Safety uh, is a huge issue. I always make the point that you can never have development without peace. Mm -hmm. And what is happening in many of our communities, you've seen the um, killing of construction workers in parts of Delft, allegations that um, some of the uh, gang leaders in the Western Cape are directly involved in tenders or at least trying to extort a percentage of those and when it doesn't go their way. Uh, people get taken out. And we've seen that happening over the last months in Delft. Almost one or two people killed every second or third week. Uh, so the circumstances of this are not clear. But what I do know is that a lot of people live in fear around the um, what's happening in regard to procurement, uh, contracts, uh, pressure on not only the private sector, but also government in terms of those who have an interest. So I'm not sure exactly what happened with Comrade Loiso and, and that needs to come out, but I think it underlines the fact that our communities um, are not stable. There are many issues which impact 
on the basic uh, conditions around safety. Mm. And without a safe environment, it's difficult for people to express their voices. Uh, voices get suppressed and development of the community suffers. Mm. I think it's a very sad day for, for Cape Town. It's a sad thing. I, I knew him when he was still in uh, Ses Corner and had okay. a few interactions with him. Um, one of my, the thing that angered me about today was um, in, in, it's a time to memorialize an activist uh, and um, he carries with him the media descriptor in, in, in the media as poo thrower. Um, now, that made me really angry because he wasn't that. He was an activist for housing and the delivery of basic services. Um, as soon as the media have tagged you with a, a particular uh, a pejorative term, I mean, they, they, they didn't, um, it's a bunch of sub-editors trying to, um, uh, to, th to throw, um, to, to effectively um, brand him as, as an other by having this tag follow him throughout his political career. And, and he was more than that. Um, and I think that, um, you, you know, it just shows that there's a particular bent to liberal media. In, you don't hear, say, um, uh, Rob Hersoff being described as a, um, a reactionary Atlantic seaboard with dubious ties to British intelligence, Rob Hersoff. He's called businessman Rob Hersoff. Exactly. No, you see, I think that is the, the problem because there isn't a genuine look um, at exactly how people live in the majority of communities. Um, Loiso and, and the so-called poo-throwing incident was literally one aspect which then became, as you say, a convenient label to discredit all of the issues around which people in civic organizations, others were campaigning around, the lack of basic sanitation, the lack of, of, of water. And they then, in a way, by giving a label like that and not looking at other aspects of Loiso's life and, and what he did, essentially, in, in, in the establishment and liberal media, he will forever have that label as if he is a person that suddenly got up one day and decided to throw poo, not looking at any of the issues, the struggles, the battles which, which led to communities taking protests. And I think that is in a way, um, simply there to discredit those who take up the real issues of, of people. Whatever one thinks about the tactic, the issue is that there's no analysis of exactly the conditions which have led to people rising up in frustration around uh, the lack of service delivery in the city. Um, you know, just yesterday, I was driving through um, the day before on Saturday in uh, Philippi, and claims to the city being the cleanest, the most functional, you know, fall flat when you actually see the level of waste, the level of running water, um, the block drains, it's all over. And I think that what we need is the ongoing uh, activism and also critically the media, which actually points to those issues, which in fact affect the majority not the issues which might affect people on the Atlantic seaboard only, but all of our issues, uh, in particular those who are living uh, in, in squalid conditions because of a very skewed budgeting and service delivery process and a total kind of almost writing out of the Cape Town story of those communities. So this is these conditions have persisted for a very long time, you know, and um, I want to talk about some of the, the, the structural uh, things in in the Western Cape, and uh, I think you're the right person to talk to because um, you know uh, the the ANC, the history of the ANC in the province in particular. Now um, the ANC didn't start in 1994, but um, we uh, we had a situation where um, the ANC had the province, the ANC had the city of Cape Town. And now sitting in 2023, the ANC is in opposition, main, in the main in the Western Cape. What do you think are those uh, circumstances and conditions that contributed to the crisis, uh, the crises in the ANC in the Western Cape? Roscoe, I think that one of the main uh, contributing factors um, has actually been the inability to 
keep the organization united and to deal with the issue of internal contestation. Um, being able to recognize the difference between lobbying for a certain perspective or a certain group of leaders, and when that process is over, then focusing on the task of the organization, which is to be visible, be present on the ground, be taking up people's issues, be linking with uh, government as we were then um, at national level as well to actually serve our people. And I think that basic falling apart through to deep-seated factionalism, um, divisions around uh, leadership. I mean, some people would say, you know, this was an issue around divisions along racial lines that... Uh, so-called African and colored people in the majority in the ANC, you know, having contestations. But the reality was that many of those groupings and factions, you know, crossed racial lines. You had white comrades, African comrades, colored comrades in one grouping, another. And I think that when that internal conflict, um, not only did it become visible in the media, but it actually affected activists on the ground. And when you're going into an election campaign and your, your, your forces, those on the ground, people doing the work, um, are divided, um, and that division, unfortunately, also then, I, in my view, lapped over into the provincial government um, where we were governing uh, in, in, in the Western Cape. So you had a divided organization, in, in many ways a factionalized organization, and then that spilt over into government as well. And the reality is, as you've said, it's now 2023 and we exited the provincial government in 2009. I'll get to the city in a, in a while. So that's literally been 14 years. And I think one of the things which has become very clear is that when you lose um, electoral support and you lose the trust um of your activists and your broader supporters, it's very, very difficult to get that back. And clearly, I think there are also many, many other issues which are which I think have impacted on the the integrity um, of the organisation itself. I do think that um, reports and um, the factual um, issues emerging from the Zondo Commission. Um, what is happening at municipal level. You see, sometimes people think that those issues are only read about, um, you know, in the on, on TV or on, on the public broadcasts and so on. But I think what also happens is that people talk, you know, or members of the organization talk, and they talk about, did you see that that person who's related to this person has just got that and do you see what they're driving now. So so that perception about an organization, which I believe has had a proud history in not only helping with other liberation movements to get to a democratic breakthrough, but I think has also done well in terms of post-94 delivery at a whole number of basic like social levels. There's a huge amount still to go and we can talk about the issue of the, the economic inequality which i think is a major issue but there were um programs there has been progress we can talk about water housing um education um opening up higher and tertiary education etc but the integrity of the organization has suffered because of divisions because of issues of nepotism issues of corruption and we know those are not unique to the anc but when you're a governing party and people see some of your leaders conducting themselves in that way, the, the trust factor um, uh, is affected. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, some people would often want to blame, you know, they would refer to the leadership uh, delivery problems nationally. Um, but I think in our province, one of the major, and that was your question, the major contributing factors um, for having lost was our internal uh, lack of cohesion, deep-seated factionalism, and ongoing contestation, which then affected our government uh, in the province and definitely in, in, in the city of Cape Town as well. And I think that's a huge lesson. So when the ANC talks now about renewal, um, it also talks about unity. I don't think we're talking about unity at uh, any cost. You're talking about 
a unity around the renewal project and an acceptance that unless we conduct ourselves and serve our people um, as a liberation movement that contests elections and we are visible and people begin to trust us again, we are going to battle, uh, especially in the Western Cape. I agree with you there on probably 100% of that, but my uh, my framing for, for that is when the ANC was strong in the province, there was a political strategy. And if we're talking about renewal and unity, um, unless there's a political strategy to unite around, we're just uniting around personality, whether we think that... Oh, um, uh, Cameron Dugmo has a nice shirt, so I'm going to get my mm. delegates to vote for him. And um, Is there a political strategy? And um, if not, why not? And what's the path to, uh, to crafting a mm. political strategy? Yeah. Um, just to say one thing about the political strategy, I think if you look back, um, I'm sure you remember that in 94, we were horrified when the National Party beat the ANC in the Western Cape, we started at 33%. I mean, this was the province where the UDF was launched. There appeared to be mass support for the anti-apartheid movement. And uh, Hannes Krill, uh, leading the National Party in this province, got 56 But there was a huge amount of work that happened at a political and organizational level. We got to 49% um, in the next uh, provincial election, which was 99 Sorry, um we got to uh, 13, uh, 42%. So from 33 in 94, mm. we moved to 42 in 99. And then 2004, which is almost what we sometimes refer to as the golden years, we got to 46. And that was enough to then form a coalition. We never actually got over 50% in the province, but we got to 46. And behind that, um, I'm sure you may have heard in terms of your engagement with activists, you know, there was a, um, Ibrahim Rasul um, and the ANC Collective actually drafted a strategy um, around uh, the issue of um, the path to power. And there was a later document around planning for power and so on, but clearly talked about work in different sectors and a number of other issues. So, and that's where the notion of the ANC as a home for all in the Western Cape, Cape came from. You probably heard. Um, activists beginning to use words about African colored solidarity, saying um, the conditions under which people are living in Bontihevel are no different to those in Langa. So the the unity between working class communities, whether one had been classified as colored or, or, or African, um, there are common issues to unite around. So I don't want to go into the details of what that's, that strategy was, but there clearly was a concerted approach to get to becoming competitive, right? So in terms of your question now, obviously this is a show that a lot of people will will see. And I think that there is a yearning, and I think many of our members and activists are calling out now and saying, we've gone to a national conference, we have a January the 8th statement, and, 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 and a theme around decisive action in the interests of the people, uh, visible decisive action, and then and the renewal of the organization. And Nationally, there's a program of action that has been developed and so on. But clearly, many of us have always argued that you need a specific strategy and approach in this province, right? Yes. And I think that our challenge always is that conferences sometimes become a place where the only focus is on who is elected, mm -hmm. as opposed to spending a good day and a half in commissions on election strategy, economic strategy, social strategy. And I think the big test for the ANC is going to be whether we can take the documents, uh, the political strategy that we've that has been developed, and um, the the approach to the elections, into a conference, rally people around that strategy, and develop consensus. I don't want to go into the details of it, but the, the challenge is at our conference will we simply focus on a leadership contest, or will as a conference agenda should do deal with the issues of strategy that are going to take us not just to 2024, where we need to become competitive, but also to 2026 when we'll have local elections again. And I think there are many, many issues that we need to look at. We've always been very strong um, in working class, particularly African communities in the city of Cape Town. But in the past, um, we had communities that we had referred to as frontier communities. Mm -hmm 
in Atlantis, uh, in parts of Delp. Delft, we've often won the Rylands Ward. So is it just let's yeah. break it down. There's the frontier um, war communities. There's hostile communities. Yes. There are, what what are the, those base, in terms of the yeah? You know, and the, and then the base communities are besides the base community base support communities in the metro. What's interesting is that in the non-metro areas, um, the Boerland, the West Coast, Overburg, Southern Cape, uh, Karoo, the ANC has historically had quite a lot of support across the racial divide amongst the working class rural people, whether African or having been labeled as um, apartheid classifications colored. And that's been interesting. There's been um, a tradition of doing better there. Whereas, and, But then again, when one looks like Mitchell's Plain at the moment, if you look at our support, which has dwindled to 7%, would now, according to some, be regarded as a so-called, so-called hostile, hostile area. Yeah. But many people forget that when the ANC, when we did our best of 46% in 2004, the ANC had the, the we were the biggest party in Mitchell's Plain in terms of electoral support. We had 30% of the support of voters in Mitchell's Plain. 30%, not over 50, but bigger than any other party. And from 2004, we had a very divisive provincial conference at the Good Hope Center. Mm-hmm. Um, you can talk about that. But then Let, we let's not. Yeah, let's rather put that <laughs> in the past. And then we we've dropped, and we're now at seven percent. So the issue is, how does the ANC ever begin to recover um, in a community which, at that stage, was definitely a frontier community because we were making gains in in Mitchell's Plain, not only the middle class suburbs of Westridge, um, but also Beacon Valley, Eastridge. The ANC had strong branches. There was that tradition coming out of the UDF from the 80s that had been carried through. So we had really, really solid branches and activists. And there was movement at a national level. We were we were working in a united way. And we've lost that. And I think that's amongst the issues of trust building, building trust across communities, and um, also in a very clear way, exposing the DA, not only in the province, but in the city. Um, there are many, many communities who want to go and buy 80 rands worth of electricity, but because they have a water um, arrears, they pay the 80 rand, but have 60 rand deducted to settle that arrears account, end up with with 20, uh, with 20 rands worth of power. Um, there's been issues around water, but the basic issue of inequality in service delivery and the deliberate attempt to divide our people um, along racial lines. Um, and it's interesting, you, you mentioned you might ask something about Peter Murray. The interesting oh, thing, what was the reaction to Peter Murray? The DA was completely silent. I'm going to get to Peter yeah, Murray to because Peter I, Murray. I think I think he deserves a whole section on his oh, own okay. about this thing. So I don't yeah, want to. No, no, sure. Um, but I think since we're talking about the the ANC's electoral performance, I think we can look at the electoral map. Yeah. Let's start with the city of Cape Town. Um, yeah, CPT. So um, we have. Yeah, so the DA 58.33%, ANC 18.6%, um, pretty much uh, almost uniformly a, a hostile electoral environment for the ANC. Um, what is the <coughs> state of things of the organization in the what we call the Dula Oma region, the metro? Yeah, well, I think that as those results um, reflect, they actually reflect a substantial decrease um, from our performance at the previous local elections. This was a local election we're talking about here. Yes. Um, that was 2016, this is 2021. And I think one of the the major issues here, um, you know, I talk traditionally about, you know, base communities of support, frontier mm-hmm. areas where we've, we've made gains, um, and then obviously the hostile areas. And it actually works out into a very basic scenario that in a community such as Camps Bay or Durbanville, Durbanville, you would have, say, 10,000 voters in a ward, might be about 13 or 14. And you are seeing a turnout there of almost 90%. Mm -hmm. In other words, 12 out of the 14,000 voting. And then in particular constituencies, in in this case, the DA getting close to 80% of that. Now, the ANC has still maintained 70 or 80% support in traditional strongholds such as KTC, um, Kailicha, Fuleni. But the problem is that of the 14,000 
registered voters, literally 50% of those voters are going to vote. So we're getting 70 or 80% of the 50%. But low turnout. And that is that is a critical issue. And I think the divisions within our organization, the, the disillusionment, and often a perception that the conditions under which people are living are actually government is government, not a distinction around the fact that the DA has been um, governing the city since 2006. But I think it's that um, um, credibility and that level of trust, uh, because in these elections we're having councillors who are standing, right, local councillors, and the ANC's worked hard to change our way of electing those councillors, not just having a branch meeting sitting together, but going out, having a branch make recommendations, but at the end of the day, a community meeting, having to endorse those candidates. But I think the the lack of the very poor turnout, um, the reaction towards division, the reaction towards a lack of visibility, the reaction towards a weak branch, literally when we went into these elections, our structures, um, you know, in, in many, many communities have dwindled, um, you know, executive executives only being elected before you get to a conference. But then after the conference, once the delegates have been chosen, the branch goes into hibernation. Yes. So it's an issue of getting our branches to do what the mandate is, to be visible, to be inducting new members, having media campaigns in the area, picking up service delivery issues, organizing meetings where the councils can come and report on a consistent basis. And we have branches who do this, and you can see the difference. So I think what you really saw in the city in 2021 was traditional ANC base areas not coming out in, in big numbers. ANC still winning those areas, um, but not not with a, with a big turnout. And then, as I said, the, the decline in places like parts of Mitchell's Plain, which were frontier areas, Atlantis, and I'm talking the city now, um, you know, literally not being able to move out of that 7, 8, 9%, whereas we had 30% at, at one stage. And I think that um, that also was um, a factor where we, we lost significant support in what we had regarded as frontier um, areas as well. So those were some of the contributing factors. And obviously, if you're in government like the DA is, you know, it's easier for you to go into an election in many ways if you're able to, you know, point to to deliveries, make sure that your activists are looked after, etc. And I think the DA has managed to to try and deepen divisions in our communities, um, has been focused on delivering to a particularly narrow constituency. And um, I think that also, you know, one always faces the issue of um, when an organization, you must remember that we had an interim provincial committee leading us into this election. And I, I always believe that when you don't have elected structures that the branches feel we were part of electing them, it's always difficult for an IPC to command the respect and the, the credibility that an elected leadership has. Um, so that was also an election that we went into. In fact, both the um, yeah the 2021 local elections, we were led into that election by a, a fairly recently appointed, or about a year and a half or so, interim provincial committee. And I think that also impacted the state of our regions, um, the state of our regional structures in the Dala Omar region, um, also same problems around um, divisions, contestation, and failure to unite around a program of action mm. as opposed to leadership um, battles. So I think those things have really affected us. In the non-metro areas, I don't know if you want to have a look at those. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll come back to the sure. point about, about uh, uh, just, just on, on, on one thing about uh, uh, visibility. Yeah. Um, since this election, we've had a caucus in the city of Cape Town of um i think uh, 11 or 12 pr councillors yeah um and they've been invisible as a caucus as individuals they haven't really been driving issues and actually issues that the anc have taken up in the past have been driven by smaller players um so what is the intervention that's needed to make to just um 
shorten the distance between, say, the, the, the council in the city of Cape Town and the masses who voted for them or potentially or could potentially vote for them. Mm. We went from, I think, 23 pure councillors in, um, in uh, 20, the, 16. The, 2016. So, no, sorry, in uh, 20... Yeah, the, 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 the previous election, yeah. And then the caucus just absolutely cut in half. That's, a, that's quite a spiral. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the results showed that we, we held on to wards, but because the PR vote was, was, was low, that low turnout that I refer to, we now have a dramatically reduced number of PR councillors, but you still have about 34 ward councillors plus the PR ones that you mentioned. Yes. But look, I think that we've definitely um, are not making sufficient effort to be not just an effective opposition, but to be visible um, and to actually utilize the opportunities um, that we do have. Because um, at one level, it's about literally um, exposing the unequal service delivery in, this, in, in, the, in the city it's, itself. And then also issues of corruption. I mean, there is huge... Um, fraud in the city housing maintenance department absolutely I massive i hope my lucy boy is listening wherever he is if well <laughs> um it would be good if he was listening um as well as his uh leaders that remain in the city because the fact for instance that um i think you're aware of of our uh push as the province uh writing to the siu to ask them to investigate this over two years ago and then other um, activists uh, also did a lot of work in terms of exposing this. Constru certain construction companies were being, um, you know, pushed aside almost to favor particular construction companies. But then what began to emerge is a very serious link uh, between um, certain companies um, whose relatives um, are actually linked to organized crime uh, in this province and uh, to certain officials and, and politicians in the city. That story is still going to unfold in terms of the extent and the depth um, of the actual corruption and the linkages. Mm -hmm. Also then what, I, what we talked about informally on the issue of extortion. So we need to be much more visible, much more effective. And what the ANC is doing in the city is making sure that in the wards where we have won those wards, um, and you might remember that we retained our uh, Ward 38 in the in the new Crossroads area. Mm -hmm. Once again, we'll buy elections or a low turnout, but we retained that uh, that ward. Um, and uh, generally, we we also saw what happened in in Maitland, where we were not able to find a candidate and we was willing to stand. The DA truly messed up, and they didn't register their candidate. And then you saw a contest between the smaller parties, which the, the PA um, eventually won, and that actually changes the whole balance of power in that particular sub-council where Angus McKenzie from the DA is actually the chair. And, uh, uh, so he may Angus, not if, be the sub-council yeah, chair anymore. I don't know how many tears will be shed if he's no longer the, the chair, but there's a strong possibility that he may a, not be. There is a strong possibility, but I think with that particular example is uh, a an acid test for this Moonraker coalition or moon moonshot thing that they... Yeah. Now that the PA are in cahoots with the DA, they could actually hold on to that sub-council, which would be a pity because after Angus McKenzie's Ghostbuster um, election campaign thing, it would have been nice to see the guy yeah. eat a little bit of humble pie just one time. Yeah, I don't think anyone should sit easy, uh, especially Angus, because the reality is that um, decisions are often made in regard to these issues based on local conditions, one situation in Joburg and another situation elsewhere, which in fact brings us to the whole issue, maybe we're not going to deal with that tonight, but on coalition government and how that has in itself um, impacted on, on service delivery. That's a whole other debate. Mm -hmm. So I definitely think it's, uh, it's not uh, something which is, which is a, closed, uh, a closed shop. So for us, um, we need to be more effective in the city and in our other municipalities where we are in opposition. 
And we, there are examples of where we are governing. For instance, we're leading a coalition in Tiervatus Kluf, and you've seen there the difference between what the ANC has been trying to do, for instance, giving um, uh, a 99-year lease to, to coloured farmers mm. in the Overberg. And actually, there was huge resistance from the white members of the DA, not the so-called coloured members of the DA. Who have 99-year leases anyway. <laughs> yeah, those, those, exactly, yeah, those especially guys. in the Selimbosh area where um, most of the, the farm leases, they are held by, by white people. And there's been no transformation by that municipality, whereas that's a perfect opportunity to give leases to black farmers, African and colored, and really begin to make a difference. So where we, there's only five municipalities at the moment where we are in coalition. So yeah, let's let's actually have a look at, at where, which... Um if you take a look at the Karoo, um, uh, no, up to the right, uh, yeah, there, um, you, you would have um, the... Langsburg municipality, Beaufort West, um, uh, and that is where the ANC is the leading party. Twenty-eight percent, not a majority party. Plurality. So in after those elections, um, the district council, Beaufort West, as well as uh, Langsburg, mm -hmm. and um, in fact Prince Albert initially were governed by an ANC coalition. Uh, subsequently, one of the independent parties lost a ward in Prince Albert, which then gave the DA majority. Um, then there's a coalition of the ANC and smaller parties in Neisner at the moment, mm -hmm. and then also in the Overberg, Tiervatus Kluf, um, just uh, over, uh, um, if you are, that's Oatswin. In fact, in Oatswin, if you go back to Oatswin, the ANC um, won eight eight wards, more than the seven of the DA. So from a point where we had literally lost all the Oswin wards, there was a massive improvement in our performance there in that the ANC ward candidates won. But once again, low turnout, so we didn't get PR seats. Mm -hmm. um, and now there's a coalition which actually involves the DA and ECOSA and, mm -hmm. and the, the Freedom Front Plus. So I think in those rural areas, um, you know, the ANC... You know, is getting close to 30%, but clearly it's still a decline from what we had um, in previous uh, in previous years. You know, if you look at local elections, 2006, 2011, 2016. So that is also an area that we, we need to focus on. But I think what is helping um, is the fact that uh, in terms of the... Our last national conference, uh, the national leadership that has, that has been elected, I think there's a very strong sense that this province needs more support. You know, we've always talked about national investment. The Western Cape is not a an independent republic as much some, as, as some people are agitating for that, literally wanting to carve out the Western Cape. It's part of South Africa. And the more our national government um, invests, and we've actually been very... Um, happy that in some of the areas, although not all the fishing um, sectors have been allocated, but in some of the allocations that have been made recently by the minister, we've begun to see um, a better spread um, of the resource um, to our historical communities. I'm saying this reservedly because there are a few sectors that still have to be announced, mm -hmm. but we've lobbied hard for that. Um, you asked earlier, like, what have we done as the opposition? What we did... Um, was move around to six coastal communities last year, talked about the FRAP, the fishing rights allocation process, explained to people, drew up a memorandum, sent that to the minister, pointed out the anomalies of some uh, historical fishing communities losing out. And the, the fishing communities, I think, have begun to see more responsiveness in that regard. We've also um, initiated a land audit where, as the opposition... We are gathering all uh, national public works, state land, provincially owned land, municipal land, and then also parastatal land. And then beginning, you know, in different communities to mobilize around identification and release of that land. And what we're finding there is that the old guard in the DA um, are resisting this. We're about now again to deal with the expropriation bill, which is finally coming to the stage of public hearings, which is going to regulate um, the way that the state is able to expropriate. On one hand, you know, you've had the normal expropriation of 
for roads and uh, schools and so on. Mm -hmm. But the new bill actually has a transformative component to it where it says one can also expropriate in the interests um, of land reform and land redistribution. And it's clear that um, the powers that be in the DA are going to oppose that, whereas in our view, we should have had this Expropriation Act a long time ago. Okay, it's not the constitutional amendment, but it's just an updating the Expropriation Act, which is also going to outline the circumstances, and I want to be clear on the circumstances under which there may be null compensation. Not like there'll be null compensation all over, but there might be particular circumstances in terms of how it is acquired. Otherwise, we the progressive thing now is that when it comes to the issue of the price of land in the instance where the state will buy, it's not simply a market price. The constitution is very clear, but it's never been tested by our courts. You have to consider a range of factors. And I think this is giving people in our province and elsewhere hope that the state is going to move. In our province, I'm not sure if you're aware, but when you look at agricultural land, less than 3% of agricultural land in the Western Cape is owned by black South Africans. And by black, I mean African, colored, and Indian. 3%. It's, it's, it's worse than in any other province. Um, and I think the, the real challenge uh, for us and, and this is our frustration with the Premier and the DA. You know, if you, you know, we've supported initiatives around uh, trying to, to, to work to make our province safer. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there are other issues that we can talk about there in regard to what we believe is the undermining of community police fora and favouring neighbourhood watches. But if you were serious, this province would create a fund to support land acquisition for black farmers. Um, we cannot have a simply not sustainable to have so much of the agricultural economy um, in the hands of a few. It's a very productive sector. There's huge opportunities, food security, value chain, employment. Um, but unfortunately, like the tourism sector, it's very untransformed. So people who have literally worked these these um, farms or worked in the industry, you know, are not part of the ownership. And I think the skewed patterns of ownership can only be dealt with once you look at actually providing capital um, for HDI individuals and communities to really gain access to, to, to assets which allow people to build strong and sustainable businesses, uh, which, which has not happened. So those are the land audit then. Um, we know, haven't we, seen a land audit. We, we just haven't. We don't know who owns yeah, what land yes. and what... That's the important There's, thing before we can talk about yes, yes. Uh, redistribution and market value and yes, and, you know. yes, and that's something that I, I know that people have been fighting to to see for a yeah. long for a very long time. So I, I think that's yeah. that's really and possible. also what is the alternative that I mean we do not support as the ANC this notion when the EFF has articulated a position. If you see a piece of land, take it. That is not going to solve the problem. But if you don't tell people where the land is and discuss an approach to releasing that land, either for industry, for sport and recreation, for human settlement, then, you know, you create the, 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 the populist culture or, at, you know, where one simply has no um, progressive and sustainable approach to land release, which is what we want. But you can only have that if there's transparency about what we have and how we can release that land. And, and this has taken too long. Mm. I think in our country it's taken too long. Um, but it's one of the issues that we will be continuing to address. I want to talk about turnout because that's a word that, that keeps on coming yeah. up in, in our conversation. Um, and then I have a, um, a study that was um, released by uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, a German, mm. uh, a, a German um Foundation. Think tank, German Foundation. The headline is, the 2021 local government election continued a trend of low and declining turnout amongst young and first-time voters. Of the nearly 1.8 million 18 to 19-year-olds who were eligible to vote in the last election, 90% did not register. Similarly, less than 20% of the population aged 20 to 35 registered to vote in contrast to 19 90 percent of the population age 40 we have a problem with getting young people to the polls uh simply because there's a there's a disconnect mm. between uh young people and politics why do you think this disconnect exists i think 
for me, one of the reasons is that the progressive youth movement in our country, and I want to, to talk, you know, whether it's the high school student movement, the Congress of South African Students, um, we have seen um, a level of activism at higher education level um, with the Fees Must Fall movement, historically Congress organizations like SASCO, um, also the emergence of the EFF student movement, often focusing on those issues directly, issues that affect them directly and campaigning around the issue of uh, fees. But the issue of then seeing the link between that and actually electoral participation, you know, at a local government election or that link is not there. Now, that is the, the fundamental question that we, we need to need to address, you know, because some people have a view that, you know, electoral po politics um, have now become a terrain for some people that have come from the, the student movement or the youth movement and are now simply in the business of campaigning for office as opposed to actually building strong organization amongst high school students, amongst the youth, amongst um, the, the students. If you look at our own ANC Youth League, and I'm sure Youth League comrades listening to this would, would, would agree, is that literally for the last 10 to 15 years, we have had a dysfunctional youth league. And if you are not reproducing um, activists who can motivate others who are coming forward, begin to engage people on organization skills, an ideological theory that inspires people to help to transform the society and to understand how voting can actually deepen uh, democracy or actually um, staying away can weaken it. Or sometimes people think that voting is enough and don't stress the importance of ongoing organization mobilization. So I think because of the weakness of, of structures, but also because of, I think, how, uh, you know, we talk the jargon in the ANC about intergenerational mix of leadership. Mm -hmm. I think there was some improvement with the NEC, but I believe very strongly that that is something which has taken too long to happen in the ANC, is that we don't have an adequate generational mix of mm. the generations coming from 80s, 90s, even more recent represented there. Because the reality is young people bring, generally speaking, a different perspective, a way of organizing, a way of doing things, talking into youth issues. So I think the importance of having a, a leadership that reflects our demographics is, is important. And I think for the organizational weaknesses, um, not addressing the youth issues, engaging in youth culture, um, and not having conscious, your your um, initiative is called, you know, conscious communication. It actually is about the consciousness of young people to understand how they can transform society, both through the political electoral process, but also by being on the ground, raising the issues, campaigning around those, and then also using the electoral system to make progressive advances. So that conscious activist that maybe, we, I don't want to roman romanticize youth activists from the 70s and 80s, but there was a conscious program of political education, consciousness raising, for people to um, grasp um, the contradictions in our society I and think, then to move forward. Do you not think it's a case of, in the 70s and as an activist, there was no career path? <laughs> but there was only, like, the you could live, they, yeah. they, 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 you could live, or die, or be detained. Yeah. So the, the realization of the ideals of the um, of the struggle were, were not yet realized. Now a young person, once they get into politics, they see a path to to getting to you know the parliament or even tenace or to council or whatever. Council. Look, I think that's the reality of um, formal democratic electoral politics. But why I'm getting back to the issue of consciousness. We live in a democracy, we can have a debate about the gains that we have made, but all of us are aware of inequality, the, the incredibly high levels of unemployment, the unequal patterns of ownership of our economy, of asset wealth in this country. So the transformation of a society is going to mean, in, 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 in my view, strategies to socialize the, the ownership of capital. I mean, we've, as the ANC, talked about bringing national legislation to guide worker ownership and participation. Um, we've had different schemes on the mines around mine workers' trusts and legislation on what mine, mining companies need to do. So the consciousness now that we need to develop is 
how do we advance the struggle now in the context of a democratic society, I would argue a constitution which does allow uh, progressive campaigning to enforce certain socio-economic rights. We often tend to focus on the human rights, which are critical, um, mm -hmm. freedom of speech, freedom of the media, and we know the, the media isn't as, as free and diverse as we know, but, uh, and we know that. But so the, we live, we're looking for a situation where, yes, you know, politics as a career is 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 much is a reality for many young people, but how do we, in that context, even point out the limitations of representative politics and the role of progressive consciousness, not only to influence the policies of parties, issues of gender? The ANC has done very well in terms of uh, gender parity. I think we've also begun to focus much more on the issue of GBV and getting it out into the open, but consciously focusing on economic strategies which are going to create a more equal society. So that, those struggles and those battles also happen within organizations around, you know, why haven't we formed a sovereign wealth fund yet? Um, you know, why haven't we looked at, at a, um, you know, a state bank? Why hasn't that happened? Um, we, the ANC's view, we have a mixed, uh, we believe in a mixed economy, but we also have um, a strong view that there are certain public goods which are best held in public hands. But when, of course, at a governance level, we've made serious mistakes, which have been exposed in the in the Gozondo Commission and, and before, um, you know, one loses that credibility. But having conscious activists which look at inequality from an economic perspective, from issues of the environment, um, then brings back the activism that there may have been and that there was in the 80s where it was a struggle about dismantling the apartheid system the struggles are new and different now um it's the focus is on those issues of inequality and then what kind of a society what kind of a financial system do we need to build to create that equal society so i think if young people realize that there's space in the organization to discuss those issues to come with proposals um they would be more Let's call it conscious commitment to ideals as opposed just to a career path. Shouldn't they rather be the people who are being proposed to rather than the ones bringing the proposals? I know it sounds like I'm beating up on you, like subtweeting no, you a little no, bit, no, you know, I because first like of all, I, I asked you about a, a regional question when you're a provincial guy, so, you know, like yeah, I, no. if I stepped on any toes, you know, no, it's no, fine. No, no. But in terms of, rep we, we mentioned representativity a lot, you know. Um, the... Um, I mean, 90% of 18 to 19 year olds didn't register. The biggest cohort, untapped cohort in, mm. in the, that's the, the path to the premiership. That's the path to, to seizing power. So I don't think that my personal view is that I, when I look at an ANC youth league um, person, I don't really see a young person. I see an older politician in training. And for me, that's the disconnect. There are some really great comrades, mm. but I don't really see them um, acting as young people, speaking as young people, lobbying for young people. Um, so, you know, the uh, gender, uh, gender um, generational mix is, 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 is very important, but also the, the kinds of people mm. that you, that you um, bring yeah. into the structures needs to be uh, looked at again, not through the eyes of, of um, the older generation, but through the eyes of young people who don't vote. Yeah, exactly. Look, I think, I mean, every day one is in contact with members of the Youth League, members of student, and there's a huge amount of talent of actually organic activists. That that's There's no shortage of that, but because of the weakness of structures and the years it's taken to have a Youth League conference, there's a, a kind of almost a... Um, you know, treading water, not moving forward. So I think ANC, we have to support our youth league to get to their, um, you know, electoral conferences, but also work in a way and take a, take the lead from those young people because they are there in our campuses, in our communities, amongst the unemployed youth. But I think we are fortunate because we, we still have those activists, but because of our own subjective factors and weakness of organization, they can be gatekeeping. You know, you're not a member of this branch, so you can't go, uh, you know, to that meeting, or et cetera, et cetera. And I think what has helped a bit was the establishment of the Oliver Tambo Political School that should have been established ages ago. 
Young people are going through those programs now. Our counselors are going before you even stand for a counselor. Mm-hmm. You have to do and four of those particular courses, etc. But I think we the ANC needs to not just strengthen the youth league, but completely look at the whole youth issue mm-hmm. fresh and anew, and find a way of mobilizing young people, getting them interested, um, and that means also the older generation has to engage with the younger gen- and share those experiences, and then hear the realities. So it's a challenge. We don't have the answers. You can't just go to someone and say, no, register to vote. Mm. You're going to have to go through a much more deep and a conscious process to to build that understanding and why it's important. And that's a long haul. You need organization to do that. Okay. I'm going to give you this. It's unopened because <laughs> I'm going to ask you to do a lot of talking now. Um, I want to get to the Peter Murray thing, and okay. particularly your input in the legislature, okay. which was, I thought it was very good today, if we can if we can cue that up. Um, so we're going to play this clip, and then um, I'm going to ask you for the context of it for people who don't, who don't follow it. So. Okay. Sorry. At least that the Premier um, would take a firm stand against racism. And I must use this opportunity, uh, Deputy Speaker, to take the Premier to task. Now, more than a month ago, a member of this House whose thinking is completely outdated and downright racist Peter Murray. called members of this House foreigners. And after the Premier of the Western Cape, as the head of his caucus and this House, head of provincial government, has not uttered a single word condemning the utterances and the subsequent behavior of Honorable Murray. Mm-hmm. And I think the DA should hang their heads in shame or just basically admit that they tolerate racism because it comes from their coalition partner, the Freedom Front. Okay. But at- so let's go into the context. What did Peter, I know what he did. What did Peter Murray say and do? And why, why is that beyond the pale? I think what uh, Peter Murray did um, in an incredibly degrading and insulting and racist way was basically say to the black African members um, of the ANC, and even you could argue, you know, members of the DA, which makes their silence even more surprising, that they don't belong in the Western Cape, that they are foreigners, um, and they essentially are not. Uh, citizens of equal status. He even, in the interjection period, said, go back to Zimbabwe. And, you know, it's such um, an incredibly um, racist and biased statement that it was almost unbelievable. And you might know that, you know, we lodged uh, an objection with the Speaker Initially, when the Speaker wanted to make a ruling a week later, Maria just said he was not available and eventually came. And the Speaker did ask him to withdraw and apologize, but he never did. Um, so in essence, what, it, what has happened is that those comments, I mean, have been taken um, personally by our members um, to have literally another member saying, you're sitting in this legislature you are voted for by the people of the Western Cape, but you remain a foreigner. So actually, you know, leave the Western Cape. Now, if you th- Peter Murray is actually representing a party, the Freedom Front Plus, which actively wants a separate uh, Western Cape. So what you can read into that, and he's upping the divide and rule and racist language. He's basically saying that this Western Cape doesn't belong to black African people as well. I mean, whether I need to go back to the Freedom Charter of South Africa belonging to all who live in it, black and white, what our constitution says. So in fact, his statements um, um, run against the very ethos of, of, of our democracy. One can go into all sorts of debates. I mean, there, some of our members were saying, you know, so is it not good enough to be bred and born in uh, in Guguletu? Is, you know, is, is that not good enough? So... It's, it's, I think for me the really shocking thing was that he, in saying so, was almost claiming to represent the Koi and the Sun. He was saying, I'm Koi and I'm Sun. I belong here and you don't belong here. Whereas I know that many people in who, who represent and take up issues of the First Nations people, the Koi and the Sun, would talk to historical relationships with um, communities, um, 
that spoke different languages. I mean, we can look at, you know, the languages and the interconnectedness between our people and the histories and the wars of conquest and so on. So it's incredibly racist and divisive, but because the Freedom Front Plus is in a coalition with the DA, literally the Premier never condemned what Marais said, despite it being a direct attack on black members, African members of the ANC, and in essence, the you know, if one looks at one or two of the black members in the DA, that's an insult directly to them as well. And the DA didn't issue a statement. There was a ruling by the Speaker. Windy didn't contest. But that's what we have found, that there's a classic race denialism. Um, if you look at any speech on the economy, there'd never be reference to the history of the colored communities who were removed economic um, exploitation which impacted on colored and African. So the, the descriptive mm -hmm. terms, even though they emerge from an apartheid area, era, are not used. Our constitution is clear and says there needs to be redress for all people who suffered unfair discrimination. That's a provision of our constitution. And those that suffered unfair discrimination essentially were everyone who weren't classified as white. There was, we, I, I don't need to tell you, Roscoe, I mean, say, we know that. So essentially then you're denying race, you're denying race as a factor which impacts on inequality, and going further, you're telling people you don't belong in the Western Cape, you don't belong in South Africa, go to uh, Zimbabwe. Incredibly insulting, and um, for me the, the real lesson here was the absolute silence and... Um, shameful silence of the DA on this matter. So why do you think that xenophobia is such a, a potent tool in <coughs> politics? Uh, well, uh, well increasing, of increasing potency these days to mobilize people uh, either <coughs> electorally or um, on, at grassroots level in communities to perpetrate yeah. acts <coughs> of violence sometimes. Yeah, I think often, you know, the contestation and battle around I'm going to cough now. It's no problem. <laughs> oh, sorry. The battle and cost contestation around scarce resources. Mm. Oh. <coughs> sorry. I'm okay. Um, I think lies at the heart of this when a perception is created that <coughs> this person came from another country, mm -hmm. took my job, and I'm not getting a job because of this person that came from another country. So it's, mm. I think it's often based on fear that one is losing out to someone who doesn't deserve it. And I think that's a very real issue. And I think our, our government um, needs to be um, very clear um, around a, um, an, a, a our implementation of policies which are fair and consistent. I think what also frustrates people is that there is sometimes a, a perception that home affairs officials are corrupted to assist certain people and people can pay for <coughs> refugee status mm -hmm. or this or that. But the danger of all of that is that one really then begins to drive divisions. I mean, this thing of Peter Murray was actually driving divisions among South Africans, which actually shows how far we still need to go to realize a basic um, call of our constitution for a non-racial country. <clears throat> we are far from that. Um, you've seen, you know, the emergence of an equality court, the, the, the legislation on racism has just, anti-racism legislation has just now gone through. Um, but then we've had problems all over the country in regard to xenophobia or and often battles about uh, resources and i think it's an an issue that uh, south africans need to confront and also engage you know with um um african people in particular who are in our country there's this weird thing that often and again it's a media construct in many ways that it's fine for east europeans or west europeans to be in in our country, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but for some reason, if a, a Zimbabwean or a Malawian comes to it, then it becomes an issue for some. Mm -hmm. And and the way that those matters are reported on is almost saying that the only valuable immigrants that we can have in a country are those that come from, from Europe. Mm -hmm. 
you know, which which adds to a very dangerous perception, um, given the fact that many, many people who come to our country are also adding uh, skills and, and so on. But I think what people do need to see is consistent application of the law. Other countries don't simply allow us to go anywhere. There has to be following of the United Nations provisions around refugees consistently and clamping down on corruption because that often leads to situations where people are here unlawfully and that creates a whole lot of uh, different problems. And I, that's where I think some people react to that as well. But if we cannot honor the basic provisions of our own constitution in terms of fellow South Africans the way Marais has done mm. in the legislature, um, how much worse is it going to be in terms of discrimination uh, towards, um, for instance, our African brothers and sisters who find themselves in this country because of a war um, or because they are here, because there's a skill that they that they offer. Uh, just quickly, um, Peter Maria spoke in Parliament. Is he protected under parliamentary privilege? Yes, he is, and that's the problem. I did submit a complaint to the Human Rights Commission, and that was the response of the Commission, because he is protected by parliamentary privilege. You can only be dealt with by the Code of Conduct Committee or a ruling. But and what's the sanction for Well, for basically that? he had to um, leave the house the, for he the day. He got to go home, home Yeah, he got to go home. Early. And his salary was docked for a day. But um, we are trying to get um, evidence of Peter Murray saying similar things outside the house. Um, there is a statement that we... Are pursuing where he's alleged to have said, I agree with every, I agree with what I said. I will, sorry, I stand by what I said. So if he has said all of that in the legislature and outside it says, I stand by what I said. So it is, look, there is parliamentary privilege. And so that's the issue. But I think what has happened, Roscoe, and I don't know if you've seen, but every time Peter Murray now speaks, the ANC members hold up um, placards, hold up placards, uh, down with racism, etc. And <clears throat> you know, we've continued to say, Murray, in the in my complaint to the Human Rights Commission, I said, besides an apology, that Peter Murray should provide funding to NGOs that actively work on anti-racism projects. So that was what my desired outcome was. And it's clear that Murray is going to be treated um, as a racist, as a divisive factor, um, until the, the, this term of, of the legislature is completed because he's hurt people very deeply and people feel the sanction uh, just hasn't been adequate. The last thing on the Peter Murray issue, yeah. but I want to talk broadly, structurally. Um, do you not think that some of the, the blame for this lies at the feet of the door of the ANC itself in the sense that the political economy of South Africa hasn't really changed that much from pre-1994 until now, in the sense that we still have a, uh, before we had a, um, a uh, we, we were controlled by elite, w exclusively white people. Now the, the some black people co-opted into that, but we still have massive inequality, um, grinding poverty and very low growth. Um, the ANC just hasn't delivered um, to uh, growth for all people as originally envisioned and that has created sort of a, a bitter contestation for resources and people have fallen back into their camps of identities like uh, and fear whereas um, so-called colored people in the Western Cape would see um, people from the Eastern Cape as being refugees as Helen Ziller mm, herself, she, yeah. uh, she said um, to an extent, those the Siska and Transka were, for all intents and purposes, different countries under the apartheid regime. So that mindset of people from the Eastern Cape being foreigners uh, rests in that. But post in the, the post-democratic era, should more not have been done uh, to actually realize, in my view, uh, uh, socialism, um, more equitable spread of resources, um, uh, we, we still have a, a grossly unequal society if you're by any metric, including the Gini coefficient and also just anecdotal evidence that you can see around. So xenophobia, and, and this, is, this will be a really controversial thing for me to say, do you think that part of that lies at the door, the, the blame for that lies at the door of the ANC? Yeah. Look, 
I don't think so. I don't think the ANC can be blamed for that, but we do need to talk about um, the economy and progress that we've made um, since 94. I think there's been a, a huge um, underestimation of the level to which um, the apartheid system not only dehumanized people, but disempowered, stripped people of wealth, stripped people of land and opportunities. You essentially had, and that's why we, we always used to talk, talk about the notion of a of internal colonialism, where you had the, the colonizing power essentially living a so-called first world life with when, in health, education, basic services, all those and over generations with people losing their land, people losing businesses, having to move. You know, you've had um, that wealth that was in many of those communities um, at particular points in terms of, say, the 1913 Land Act or even business people that were functioning and before the Group Areas Act. So people often say, oh, you're just going back to the past, but I think we cannot repeat enough how the structural inequalities are so deep that the beginning to move out of that, anyone who thought that we could do that in 25 to 30 years, I think it it, it was an unrealistic thing. I would argue <clears throat> that if you look at the way the fiscus um, that's been available to the, the government, whereas you know 70% of the fiscus previously would be applied to look after a minority of the community and would have... Um, different levels of education, health, and you can track all the expenditure, you know, the actual costs of apartheid. But if you look at the fact that, um, you know, government has invested in regard to no-fee schools, the fact that we've um, introduced uh, a funding model for universities that does, doesn't discriminate on the basis of wealth, that if your family income is such and you achieve the marks at school, you, you can... Uh, you can go. Um, as much as I also said earlier, we haven't moved fast enough at all on land um, distribution, on land um, restitution. The ANC has actually made some significant gains there in 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 restit uh, restituting land. I think when if if one looks at housing, you know, the issue of a basic amount of water, basic amount of electricity at a social level. At a social level, this, the expenditure, the social basket, the fact that after long struggle we have a, a living wage, I'm sorry, a minimum wage, and the living wage is, a, is an issue that we, we need to deal with. And you would know that, for instance, that uh, is now, depending on the sector, between 4,000, 4,400 rand a month, which is still a, a low amount, but it's now legislated. And I also want to remind listeners that it was the DA who opposed that and said a minimum wage which should be the same as an old age pension, 1,800. Mm. That, that is the, the closeness that they have to the business sector in terms of, of, of that issue. So what I'm <clears throat> saying in, in trying to answer your question, it's unquestionable that in terms of expenditure on basic services, the social wage, there's been huge advancement for many, many people, um, for the majority of people. But the the key issue, and that's why there was discussion, you would recall, talking about the second phase, you know, what people, the second phase being the economic issue. Um, figures on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange um, are better than they were in 94, but just marginally, marginally better. You know, and, and the stock exchange is not the economy. The yeah, stock no, exchange no, is the, one, it's one, one part of where certain capital is speculated yes. about, yeah. But in terms of um, what I mentioned earlier, around um, equitable um, access to the ownership of factories. We've had ESOPs um, in the past, uh, some of these mechanisms to create worker um, participation in ownership and shares, but it hasn't been generalized. So the, the need for us to actually regulate and um, encourage um, worker trusts, um, worker ownership systems so that you not only have a living wage, but there's a, a, a dividend that any worker gets from, from the company. We, For me, if, if one looks at income inequality, unless one links ownership through a share ownership scheme with living wage, you're not going to break through the issue of income inequality. Then we can talk about asset um, inequality. I've talked about the land ownership figures in the Western Cape of agricultural land. 
And in the context of a mixed economy where we do have a system of private uh, property, we also have state property, we have communal property, um, the the figures for those who have so-called um, title, uh, cut and transport, as it's referred to in Afrikaans, title to, to their properties is very low in our province in particular. And that is um, uh, other forms of, of uh, tangible assets. And those measures are clearly not what they should be. Mm-hmm. So, but whether in saying that that um, that that has contributed to um, the issue of um, xenophobia uh, because of a slow the slow pace of economic transformation in terms of uh, ownership uh, of of industrial productivity of factories etc. I think that. In general terms, we're dealing with a situation that is broader than just our country. We're dealing with a continent. Yes. We're dealing with um, military conflicts in some parts of our continent, which do create genuine refugee situations. Mm-hmm. You're dealing with governance issues in, in, in many countries where the state, and I would argue that, yes, we have had huge issues around corruption, but generally we have an open and transparent system of taxation, of how money gets used. There's legislature committees that look at it. Um, so the state has been able to use the resources. I think we have a long debate about um, the cost of money and the role of the Reserve Bank and whether its role should be much more focused on on employment as opposed to simply um, inflation uh, and price uh, stability. And we can have that debate. The last so, person who tried to have the debate got impeached. Who are you, <laughs> who are you referring no. to? <laughs> the former public protector. Yeah. Um, but that in was, a very clumsy way. Yeah. But yeah, but I think it's that issue um, is for me. It remains an important debate: um, the issue of the role of the Reserve Bank in 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 the issue of the the cost of money. And, and we are a small emerging economy. We not, but we can have that debate. So what I'm saying is that the focus on changing ownership patterns, beginning to socialize capital, where workers um, begin to own. Uh, parts of a factory creating cooperatives. You mentioned yes. the cooperative version. I mean, I just don't think, if you look at how historically the National Party government built cooperatives to boost white Afrikaans farmers, they built an incredibly strong cooperative movement. And I don't think we built a culture around cooperative ownership of, of assets and so on. So we haven't made sufficient uh, uh, advances in regard to economic transformation. We clearly haven't. Um, but we've made significant advances on the social sector. And I wouldn't say that that is, res- I think generally the issue of unemployment, the fact that not enough of our people and our young people are working, that creates tensions because there's a fight over actual uh, jobs. And um, that's why the issue of increasing economic growth as per the um the economic recovery plan is critical. We got hit by COVID. We got hit by many things. Power availability or lack of it is, is also having an impact. And that's a very negative thing for the country and perceptions about the ANC as well. <clears throat> but I would say that um, arising from the conference and beginning to see, I, in my view, a much more balanced approach towards our energy needs. They seem to have been, in my view, too much of a focus that renewables could solve all of our problems without understanding that we need, um, you know, not, uh, at the moment, 90% of our energy needs come from coal. If you're not repairing the power stations while you prepare for and you don't define a just transition. So I think there's been more of a pragmatic approach to the, our energy mix and not the focus on one to the exclusion of the other, which often becomes a dominant issue in the media as well, yes. as our renewables can just solve everything. And I think that's where a mistake has been made. Um, but yeah, I think that it's up to the ANC now to begin to grow the economy, deal with um, issues of service delivery and infrastructure, and by being in touch with the people, begin to win win the trust back. Cameron, so I hope you warmed up because this is the real reason why I brought you this next question, okay. this next thing. In three months' time, it is the fortieth anniversary of the formation of the UDF, the United Democratic Front. You were involved in this. You were one of the one of the main Owens in in the UDF. Um, please tell me what the UDF means to you. Reflecting on that, um, just as you're sitting here right now, the legacy of that movement. What made it so special? 
what was the um, what con- constituents that it drew from, particularly here in the Western Cape? Yeah, look, I think I must um, clarify your reference to be me being one of the main Owens because oh, no, no, I just want to just give a little bit of history because <laughs> sometimes people think um, you know at, at a level of age. So I just wanted you to just talk a little bit about that because it did the UDF had a huge impact on my life and my participation in struggle, but. The, the generation that actually were there to, to launch it in 1983 was slightly a, a, um, ahead of me. So, for instance, we became involved in the, U, in the UDF through the affiliates. You know, we had the non-racial student movement. So, um, historically, white students were part of NUSAS and then black students part of Azaso and then also COSAS, the high school student movement. We actually also built a... Um, a group called PAG, the Pupils Awareness and Action Group, which organized in schools like Westerford, Cape Town High in the 80s. But anyway, these students uh, became affiliated to the UDF. So I recall being part of UDF GCs and area committees from, you know, 84, 85. But the actual launch, and I'm putting this on record, you know, you'll find pictures of Joe Marx, Trevor Manuel, Archie Gumede, but literally, um, I was a, a, a second-year student at the time, just being in, inducted, and I was um, recruited into the ANC in about 87. But the UDF impacted on so many of our lives, I think in a few ways. It, you couldn't become an individual member of the UDF. You had to come through an organization. So either like uh, Cape Areas Housing Action Committee, um, KHAC, Western Cape Civic Association, COSAS, New Sassasasso, You had area committees, um, trade unions. So it was really a popular front (coughs) where organizations came together under this banner of the front and sort of developed a minimum program Mm -hmm. around which people uh, united. So it... um, I'm not... Yes, of course, there were ideological debates at times, but the focus was literally uniting the people. UDF unites apartheid divides. It was building a broad front against um, apartheid, um, undermining the illegitimate uh, local authorities there, the management committees, the black local authorities, uh, this whole notion of building almost an alternative or people's power, an alternative to the... But for me, um, it was mass-based. It was focused um, on a particular issue, it um, built non-racialism. I mean, I have vivid memories of a student activist going into KTC, into Mitchell's Plain, million signature campaign um, that, that that we conducted, going door-to-door collecting signatures for the release of political prisoners and meeting activists from different communities. And I think many of those activists were kind of, in a way, um, building kind of a non-racial activism across Mm -hmm. the historic uh, racial lines. And I think for many of us that opened up our our eyes, I think whether we were black students or white students, we were having, um, we were were being pulled together um, on the basis of uh, a common belief. I know that although the end conscription campaign wasn't a direct UDF affiliate, there were many of us from other affiliates who also got involved in the end conscription campaign. Um, and that, as a single issue campaign at that time, actually had a huge impact on sections of the white community because young men were dying in Angola. They were going into the townships. They felt, some of them at least, felt uncomfortable. Their mothers, their girlfriends, boyfriends, you know, and it and became an issue, even a self interest issue in the white community. Why do our young men have to go and fight in the first place? And then, as consciousness developed, why are we, what are we fighting for? And that broadness of approach, um, you know, was, I think, also inspired by the UDF type of uh, politics. But I think um, it was issues of accountability, um, issues of local um, taking up the issues of the people. So if the trade unions brought an issue about a um, a factory where workers were um, being... Uh, mishandled, unfairly treated, that would become an issue that the area committee would take up. So it was focused on people's interests, although under the umbrella of a broader political push that apartheid is evil, unjustifiable, it must be replaced by one person, one vote, 
freedom of political prisoners, etc. And it established um, a, a kind of a mass movement. You would remember that the ANC had, was, was banned still. Um, many of the movements were actually suppressed, the leadership under banning orders. So the UDF was almost an emergence of mass popular organization again, which was truly inspired people uh, to, to get involved. And yeah, it it um, it had an impact, I think, particularly on activists like myself and many others. And I, and I want to say it again, like 84, 85, became much more involved, was not there planning the launch. But f as student affiliates, we got very involved. And, you know, dealing with issues of comrades and friends being detained, um, you know, seeing support committees emerge, going into townships. I remember in the mid 80s, there was the Vitduka war um, in KTC where the conservative leadership of many of the black local authorities were literally targeting comrades. And, you know, we were literally having to go in, provide support, get people out. Um, you know, f shacks were being born, burned by the Vitduka. It was like almost a mini civil war uh, which many people got drawn into. So those were experiences for me as a, you know, 21, 22 year old, you know, being exposed to all of that, um, you know, did help that my mom, my mother, for instance, was a Black Sash member and yes. she was quite a, a conscious uh, uh, member of a very conservative community in George where we grew up. But being exposed to non-racial politics, mass politics, tools of organization, strategy and tactics, building a broad front, seeking consensus, I think those were all very important lessons. How did the UDF manage uh, internal, um, I would say, differences? <laughs> it's interesting that you ask because, you know, people often, you know, in discussing UDF politics in the Western Cape uh, context, would say, you know, there were the Isolites and the Trevorites and, you know, sort of different perspectives and around personalities. But generally, I think the way that differences were managed was that there was a campaign, there was a vision, there was an outcome that we were seeking to achieve to destroy apartheid. So yes, there were elections for UDF executives. And I remember at one stage, many of the UDF leadership were detained in uh, polls more and, and many restricted. And some of us had to form a UDF interim committee um, to run the defiance campaign in 1989 that I was very involved in with people like Dalla Omar, Willy Hoffmeyer, Bulilani Nguka, Mbui Khalawi and others, but also to organize the, the AGM of the UDF Western Cape. Um, but then, you know, that was 89, then we came to 1990 and the unbanning and so on. But um, the, 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 the issue um, was that those divisions were not that great because people were it was the free Mandela campaign, the march to Polesmore. It was things that were going on in Belgravia Road. So people were united around that struggle. And the issue of seeking, you know, who's going to be the secretary of the UDF were were not really there. I mean, they were, as I said, referred to the one ideological difference was that in our province, you know, you you sort of had the, the unity movement tradition um, who were very critical about the, the, what they refer to as the charterists, you know, the Freedom Charter mm -hmm. people. There was obviously the PAC who had left um, the ANC because of the participation, I think initially mainly of members of the Communist Party, um, but also, you know, because of the participation of, of, of whites within the organization. And, you know, we, 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 you know, you had different types of politics. So, so some of the left movements helped kept themselves out of the UDF. So the challenge was actually building this broad front and even at the struggles in sport, you know, there was SACOS and then the move towards the National Sports Congress. National Sports Congress came and was part of the UDF, etc., in which people who were not Congress people or charterists, um, you know, had a problem with. But so it was those politics. And I remember once one of the Kennedys came to visit uh, from the U.S., de from the Democratic Party. And there was this huge debate about whether, um, you know, taken from a perspective of the U.S. being an imperialist power, and at that time you would remember that Reagan and others, mm -hmm. you know, didn't support uh, sanctions. But I must get the timing exactly. Anyway, there was a debate, but eventually the, the, the outcome was won by those who argued that by having a platform, 
um, or finding a way, you know, to isolate apartheid further, um, you know, one would not need to have an antagonistic approach towards the visit and so on. So th there were those issues of strategies and tactics, but it wasn't differences around, oh, I like Roscoe more than I like Cameron or whatever, or maybe we differed on perspectives mm. about how to prosecute the struggle and take it forward. So I think those internal issues were almost subsumed in the immediate campaigns of actually liberating our country, freeing political prisoners, um, and banning political organizations, um, starting genuine negotiations for a democratic constitution. And I think for those many early years, that was the focus. And it the mission. See, and the mission, mm. yeah, and what, peop what united people. What strikes me about the UDF era, it was a, um, a, a true rainbow coalition. They talk about rainbow coalitions now. That, that's yeah. the the, um, the word of the month. But uh, the UDF drew f people from all races, uh, all cultures, all backgrounds around this uh, around the struggle. Yeah, I mean the the mobilization in the Christian community. There's so many examples of how the church came church leadership came out and got involved and had congregations coming with them, the Muslim community, um, the organizations like Jews for Justice at the time, who sort of came out. So it was, as you say, a very broad and a consciously inclusive, as broad as possible. And I think that's where the debate happened. Like, are you including liberals in this? Are you including, you know, how broad is this front? Mm. And it was a, a lesson in, in front politics. And I think one of the things we've lost is our ability to to, wa to work broader in society, yes. um, to actually make sure that we engage about the real concerns, which the same organizations that we were working with then in the front have today, whether they are civic or ratepayers organizations, issues of the, the trade unions, concerns that the churches or faith communities have. So I think there are many lessons from that area, era, but I think we were, we, we learned a lot from being in that generation. Basic strategy, tactics, organizing, getting on the ground, uh, working in, in ways which didn't get you arrested. Um, and, you know, the, I think the threat or, always of detention, arrest, uh, potential um, hit squads were, were things that made one, you know, operate in quite a cautious way, um, but at the same time you had the sense that you were actively in a struggle, that there was support from others, other comrades, there was support from the international community as well, from certain communities and countries, and the sense that we were we were struggling for, for justice, against injustice. The, the lines were quite clearly drawn, mm. and I think that helped to mobilize people. This is the last difficult question okay. that I have for you. <laughs> um, the UDF being assimilated into the ANC. Now, that the, the cohorts that made up the UDF sort of um, disintegrated and dispersed into the polity. Do you think that that assimilation into the ANC was mismanaged? Because now we see a situation where we, we can't, uh, it's almost impossible to conceive of such a coalition between such diverse groups of people coming together again. Yeah. Well, look, the, the UDF's constitution um, and its aims and objectives were clearly set out. So the UDF had succeeded in its broad historical mission, if you like, to ha have assisted in creating a democratic uh, dispensation in our country. And the reality is that Many of the people in the UDF affiliates, um, like say, I'll use myself an example. I was in USAS. Yes, I was, um, you know, in the mid 80s recruited into the ANC underground. <clears throat> there were others who were not, but after uh, the democratic breakthrough and the UDF being disbanded, people, many people did join ANC branches or they just, just got on with their lives or they became supporters or there were others who, who never joined the ANC. But so then it became the process of the liberation movement establishing, establishing itself in a way that it could operate as a political party as well. Mm. Structures, branches, contesting elections. And that obviously changed the, um, the, na the, the nature of um, 
the the struggle it became less it became more institutionalized mm-hmm. as you're operating within a system but you would remember that the so, the so-called pillars of the struggle that we used to talk about in the 70s and 80s were the international isolation of apartheid the armed struggle we can assess all how effective they were and then it was the political underground was the third pillar and the fourth one was the mass pillar which many of us some of us were involved in both the political underground and the mass struggle others were involved directly in mk and the international so people so now you this organization of people from exile people from internal you know and that that threw up its own contradictions so i am in my own view it was correct that at that point um the udf you know disbanded so that you use the word of assimilation i think i don't know if if that's the correct word because yes many of the leaders became leaders formally in the ANC um, after that some would say uh, used not use the word some some would you do use the word uh, co-opted yeah no some way. would some would use that word but what i'm saying is that if you look at it, the organizations which constituted the UDF like say the trade unions um the student movement the youth movements in the real so you had South African Youth Congress then and then that became ANC Youth League so a vehicle like psycho which is organizing progressive youth is no more and we talked earlier about the weaknesses of the youth league and the need to strengthen it so it did change the dynamic um but what i'm saying is that i don't think there's um that the, you know front politics as such as uh, has outlived its usefulness i think progressive front politics around campaigns for for instance a living wage um campaigns against um corruption campaigns against eviction of farm workers you know i think there's a possibility of building those coalitions or those fronts around particular issues but it's 40 years of the udf on 20th of august 2023 this year mm-hmm. and um i've heard that there there is going to be quite a significant um remembrance of that day and also a reflection on some of the issues we've been talking about what are the lessons learned how do we work in an inclusive way how do we build mm. consensus how do we avoid leadership conflict actually demobilizing the organization and taking us uh, off our goals so i think it's going to be an interesting time to reflect on that 40 years i can't believe that it's it's uh, 40 years ago but literally that's what it will be this year i can't believe it's already april uh, time time's going <laughs> i can't faster. believe it's already 10 past 9. <laughs> Cameron, thank you so much for coming and uh, I really appreciate you. Thank you. Um, it was a pleasure, Roscoe, and I hope we can do it again. No, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Super. Thanks. And keep up, eh? Uh thanks for providing a platform um for different voices and um it would be good to see some more of the young voices also coming out and like your question that you asked, why is there this this gap between formal participation in the political process not it would be great to have some young people actually engaging on those issues together with uh, those of us who form a certain part of the generational mix you know <laughs> thank you thanks cameron cool sure. we back next monday hopefully join us then thank you nantel and we out